we will be organizing the memorial lecture every year for the first memorial lecture we have sri anirban ganguly ji here who will talk about articulating bharat presenting bharat on a global stage before starting the program i would request all of you to stand at a place and sing the national song vande mataram along with us Now I would like to request our faculty advisor, uh, Professor Verma, to come on dais and introduce the group. Namaskar. I इस संध्या में आप सभी का स्वागत करता हूँ और especially हमारे जो guests हैं अनिवार्य पटाचार उनका भी करता हूँ. और वंदे मातरम के बारे में बताना चाहूँगा कि हमारा जो विज़न है टू मेक द यंग जनरेशन सोशली अवेयर विथ रेलिवेंट इन्फॉर्मेशन रिगार्डिंग टॉपिक्स ऑफ नेशनल इंटरेस्ट कल्चरल हेरिटेज एंड साइंटिफिक डेवलपमेंट दीज आर द थ्री मोटो व्हाट वी हैव इट फॉर वंदे मातरम एंड वी हैव बीन सक्सेसफुली डूइंग ऑल दिस लेक्चर्स इन द लास्ट आई थिंक फोर ईयर्स नाउ अप्रॉक्सीमेटली इन टू ईयर्स रफली नो बट बिफोर दैट ऑल्सो वी यूज टू डू दैट but now the formally the vande mataram guru has been formed and since then we are all coming and uh, listening all those things so our mission is to conduct events of introduce sens and sensitize this is a very important word sensitize the student community about india's rich cultural economical socio political scientific and technological heritage this is a very important that we have to touch every aspect of the uh, globe a dimension in our society and that's what we are doing and we are also having a contemporary issues lectures which we are doing it i mean last two three lectures were very very informative regarding the kashmir regarding the uh, some other fellows even even uh, that uh, our the constitutional writer uh, dr ambedkar uh, those are very informative which people do not knew it uh, how they live what they did basically so uh, we do all those things and we discuss a lot in those things we invite the variety of dignitaries in this uh, in this session which are uh, really really knowledgeable and they are well established personal we don't invite somebody who has a, you know kind of a having more political and shouting here uh, we don't like to do that we want to have a, a imbibition of knowledge with scientific things in in this one and that's what we do it very clearly so we our aim is also work to arrange program related to student community of iit because iit iit students are uh, very intelligent in terms of when they come here and we want them to uh, relate themselves to the mainstream of the indian uh, societies and events even the international events which are going into that also and also we work for the betterment of society and positive approach doing self service like teaching tree plantation and cleanliness etc so without taking these are our aim of vande mataram here in iit madras and uh, we welcome our guest faculty and student for tonight i hope that it will enrich our more mind and we'll have some good thoughts when we go back from here thank you so much before we move on i would like to take the opportunity to introduce our guest dr anirban ganguly 
Dr. Ganguly is the director of Dr. Shyama Prasad Mukherjee Research Foundation. He is a scholar, civili scholar of civilization, history, politics, and culture. He is a member of policy research department and library and documentation department of the Bharti Janata Party. He is a member of the Central Advisory Board of Education and visiting faculty at Banaras Hindu University. A columnist and a keen student of philosophy, Dr. Ganguly is fascinated by and tries to interpret the evolution of Bharat as a civilizational state. A ceaseless quest of trying to articulate the Bharti view pushes him into writing. So now, as per our tradition, I would like to invite Professor Kalmarkar to welcome our guest uh, on the behalf of IIT Madras with the fruit basket. Now I would like to call Mrs. Chitra Jain to uh, present the fruit basket to Mrs. Anutama Ganguly ji. Now I would like to request Sri Anurban Ganguly ji and his wife Mrs. Anutama Ganguly ji, Professor Verma sir, Karmarkar sir, to present uh, uh, respect to Dr. to Bankim Chand Chandra ji with flowers. I would like to request Dr. Anirban Ganguly ji to address the audience. atmosphere has become very solemn. One can really feel uh, that uh, definitely it is something different. And I think uh, ours must be the only group perhaps across the country today to celebrate and remember Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay. There's a, I don't know whether it is apocryphal, but there is a, there's an interesting incident. If somebody came to his house and said, is Mr. Bankim Chandra Chatterjee there? So it seems uh, Bankim Chandra would open the door and say, no, there's no Mr. Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. So you'd get extremely irritated if somebody said Mr. Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. Either you'd say Shrijukt or Shri. Similarly, it is said that if uh, somebody spoke about Ishwar or God in front of Thakur Sri Ramakrishna as Lord. If somebody addressed Ishwar as Lord, Ramakrishna would make fun. 
and say, look, look, he's addressing, look, he's addressing Ishwara as Lord, you know, like that. So I just remembered that. <laughs> so uh, I make it a point to keep reminding myself never to say Mr. Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. So anyway, uh, I think those who have come 160 kilometers from down south, uh, I would like to at first express my regret to them that they have taken the effort to come and uh, listen to me. Uh, well, it, one feels flattered, but at the same time, one can sympathize also. With the... So I would like to thank uh, the Vande Mataram Forum uh, for having thought of this unique way of paying tribute to a very unique imaginator. Sri Aurobindo calls Bankim Chandra nation builder. And he says that the concept of mother India was there. We felt, but it was Bankim Chandra who basically gave shape to the contour of Bharat Mata. He taught us how to articulate our emotions in describing that presence and aura. And it is in that sense that Bankim becomes a Rishi. He becomes a nation builder. And he becomes that epochal thinker who basically gave voice to Indian nationalism in this sense. And it's very true, and uh, you may have noticed that I retweeted it today, that Bankim Sri Aurobindo says, will be remembered. He has written some novels. He's written novels. He's written poetry. He's written a lot of essays. But Bankim, for ages, will primarily be remembered as a nation builder. Therefore, it's a very Honor, honoring but humbling as well to be able to come today and say a few words. Very interestingly, 160 kilometers away from the place where one of the finest essays on Bankim was written. I think uh, in an age when there was a constant tussle between how we aspire to describe ourselves and the stereotype or narrative of ourselves that was imposed on us, Bunkim played an extremely crucial role in liberating us from that imposition. And I think, therefore, Bunkim's relevance continues today. In fact, as the years go by, Bankim becomes more relevant. And therefore, he also remains uncomfortable for those who wish to arrest or who wish to delay or who wish to negate the self-recovery of India. Bankim epitomizes, symbolizes, represents that civilizational effort at our self-recovery. And therefore, when I say articulating Bharat, that articulation is essential for us to recover ourselves. And in that recovery of ourselves, the first step or the first dimension is to know who we are, as a civilization, as a people, as a continuum, and then to be articulate, to be able to articulate that coherently, cohesively, forcefully, convincingly to a wider audience. Bankim, in his time, did that extremely effectively. So he talks about. Swaraksha, Swajan Raksha, and Swadesh Raksha. And he says that 
one of the signs of a national resurgence, one of the signs of a national recovery is when one can protect oneself, when one can protect one's people, and one, when one can protect, protect one's nation. So anyway, these I just thought I'll make a few prefatory observations on Bankim because as I said that, you know, you, it's very interesting that you have a second phase of renaissance of sorts starting in Bengal. And I think every time there is a cyclical wave, one cannot do without Bankim at the center of it. So in 1901, when Swami Vivekananda visited Dhaka, that was one of his last visits, he met a group of young revolutionaries. Rather, they went and met him. And uh, in his book, Swami Vivekananda's brother, in his seminal book, Prophet and Patriot, Swami Vivekananda, writes how when they asked him, what is it that you want us to do for national service and national regeneration? Interestingly, Swamiji had told them to do only two things to start with. Obviously, to organize yourselves, to organize libraries across the country, across the province, and to read Bankim. Because one cannot think of a national regeneration, as per Swami Vivekananda, without reading Bankim or marginalizing him. So in our discourse, in this entire narrative that we want to create, for the time being, we call it a counter-narrative. A counter-narrative is only when you assume that the other narrative is the mainstream. But for the moment, let's call it a counter-narrative. So when you want to create this counter-narrative, and all of us who have gathered here today, I assume, believe in the necessity of creating this counter-narrative, Bankim should form a significant pillar of that counter-narrative. It has been, uh, I think, the bane, bane of our intellectual effort that there has always been a hesitation in describing ourselves, in stating who we are, or even in making uh, a drawing, a framework of, of who we were. For example, last year when I was here in Chennai participating in an education conclave, I asked the audience whether they knew that they were sitting very close to a particular village, which is now probably an overgrown town, which is called Uttaramerur, not very far from Chennai, from Madras. And whether they had heard of the Uttaramerur inscriptions of the Chola period, a thousand years ago, which accepted by experts is one of the earliest constitution that Indian civilization gave or produced. And they had not heard. They had not heard this fact that the Uttaramerur inscriptions clearly demarcated and delineated who could hold public office, what were the qualities required for someone to hold public office, who could be or ought to be disqualified from holding public office, and very importantly, when one should demit public office. But surprisingly, there is no discussion. And I'm just giving one example. There is no discussion on this in our syllabus. There is no discussion on this amongst uh, our political class. And we do not take this into consideration when we talk about the theories of politics that we have produced in this country. This is just a one example, the symptom of the deeper malaise that actually affects us and prevents us from articulating the entire vision, our civilizational vision. So therefore, one thing that it does is, it doesn't generate that confidence, it doesn't generate that pride in your civilizational experience and repository. Mind you, I'm not saying that we need to glorify. I'm basing my thesis 
on empirical evidences that are there, but which over the last 70 years we have ignored evidences which, if included in our systems of education, in our discourse, in our mainstream dialogue, would have enabled us to wholly recover out of the hangover of colonialism. Therefore, often a uh, few thinkers have obviously asked whether the Indian mind has actually been decolonized. So in any case, <laughs> I want to you know, start off with, uh, I mean, start in the sense I've already started. I don't want to scare you. I mean, it's already 15 minutes that I've spoken. But I just want to bring to, you, uh, uh, bring to your notice this very interesting debate. And then I'll tell you why I'm saying it. This very interesting debate that took place in the Lok Sabha in 1966. And unfortunately, you know, lo Loyites themselves have given up on Loya. So it has come to us to speak on Loya. It has come to us to discover the beauty of actually reading Loya. And this debate is on history, on historians, and on historiography. And look at what Ram Manohar Loya says. And I'll link it to why I am mentioning it. He says, if the reading or writing of history goes wrong, grave consequences might follow. For history is, after all, a process of understanding the past, Whatever it is, correct or mistake, full or partial, determines our present and the future. If our understanding is wrong, our making of the present and the future also goes wrong. I mean, this is not a RSS historian who is a member of the ICHR. This is Ram Manohar Lohia. Then he says, historians, both Indian and foreign, are such rotten-headed people. It is ingrained into the minds of our children that India had nothing of its own. Everything was either imitated or influenced by outside factors. These historians can go to absurd lengths to prove that point. Uh, this is Ram Manohar Lohia. Then he says, this division of India into Aryan, non-Aryan, Dravidian, etc. is a myth. Ram Manohar Lohia. And then, I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful speech that he delivers. He says, then he says, and I'll just, the problem of the Nagas, the Mizos, Kashmir, Adivasis, and the like, have behind them this poisonous error of interpreting our history in a wrong way, of dividing the people into Aryans, non-Aryans, Dravidians, and Mongols. And this whole edifice has been erected on the slender evidence of linguistic variations. And finally, history, as I have pointed out earlier, is the understanding of our past. Our understanding of the past is erroneous now. And the younger generation is not proper, taught properly. Therefore, this country cannot achieve happiness or prosperity. Why I mention this is that Ramanur Loya in 1966 forms part of a long legion of thinkers, nationalist minded, who actually worked themselves up on this issue. Unless you are taught who you are in a right perspective, you cannot articulate what you wish to be. And therefore, I say that this entire effort at articulating Bharat has been a stunted effort and has been an effort which has been reductionist in its approach. Now, it's very interesting that, you know, uh, uh, Tagore also says this something very interesting. Now, uh, well, there's a perception, you know, Tagore was made global much before he became internationalist because it suited a certain political ideology to turn Tagore into an international, uh, you know, in a, in, into an advocate of internationalism. Whereas Sri Aurobindo, Ananda Kumaraswamy, Swami Vivekananda, 
speak about or rather they have a disdain they display a disdain for what they what they have termed especially this term is from anand kumara swami what anand kumara swami has termed as rootless cosmopolitanism that you are you espouse cosmopolitanism but you are not rooted to your civilizational fundamentals so you become a world citizen even before like shri aurobindo used to say no before having international you should first have national it is only then that you have international and this is there in his evening talks so what happens you become before your time you become a global citizen and then you are worried why there is a you are worried about uh, the revolution in vietnam you are worried about the revolution in cambodia you are worried about the revolution in uh, in the you know in the in the tiananmen square and what's going to happen there but you don't worry about about where you stand so you have this famous philosopher lesser known again because he's marginalized and uncomfortable for those uh, who have been deciding uh, policies in this country over the past 70 years you have kc bhattacharya who in his seminal essay swaraj in ideas and all of you must please read that it's on our in fact of all the interesting places that you'll find it is on the bjp online library that we have created with 5000 books you will find swaraj in ideas there and kc bhattacharya says that you know we have and this was a speech talk he delivered sometime in 1935 at the invitation of a group of revolutionaries in chandanagar like i am invited also by a group of revolutionaries to speak here so kc bhattacharya was invited there i mean don't look at yourself anything less than revolutionaries because you people are organizing talk on bankim here i mean it's a, you require a lot of you require as much strength as bankim had to write what he wrote so kc bhattacharya says that uh, we have very good idea about world thought we have a fairly good understanding about um, you know western philosophy about western articulations etc etc but have we ever tried to articulate uh, you know all about us based on our traditions based on our parampara or our knowledge systems have we tried that unfortunately we have not and he said this in 1935 and i think that still holds ground though a lot of that ground has started shaking in the last uh, few years i think that is the melody which has stuck to us and as tagore beautifully said he beautifully put it and since you know i am here in an academic institution so obviously it's not all rhetoric as you have seen i have prepared so i am allowed to quote and cite and i'll give you references also if you wish to i think uh, so you can say that this was an academic talk and it was not just a uh, political gassing or something like that so tagore says the history is that we have been taught and i just want you to juxtapose what tagore has said to the situation today he says and he wrote this in this uh, beautiful essay that he wrote bharatvarsh and he wrote this during the swadeshi period there was no english translation of this essay available which was originally obviously in bengali then a very senior uh, scholar shibesh bhattacharya translated it and then it was hosted on the uh, international forum for india's heritage which is run by michel danino and it is available online so i would request you to please read it because i i extensively cite cite it so tagore says the histories that have been taught to us make you feel that bharatvarsha did not exist at all as though only the and you see the beauty of the language and this is just a translation as though only the howling whirlwind of the pathans and the mughals holding aloft the banner of dry leaves had been moving around and round across the country from north to south east to west however while the lands of the aliens existed there also existed the indigenous country otherwise in the midst of all the turbulence who gave birth to the likes of kabir nanak chaitanya and tukaram it was not that only delhi and agra existed then there was also kashi and navadweep 
द करंट ऑफ लाइफ दैट वॉज फ्लोइंग देन इन द रियल भारत वर्ष द रिपल्स ऑफ एफर्ट्स राइजिंग देयर एंड द सोशल चेंजेस दैट वर टेकिंग प्लेस नन ऑफ दीज फाइंड एन अकाउंट इन आवर हिस्ट्री टेक्स्ट बुक्स सो आई थिंक ओवर द लास्ट मेनी इयर्स instead of really looking and presenting as tagore says the actual ripples of our life there has been a lot of conflict that has been generated a perception of which uh, you know uh, uh, ram swarup describes this as the politics of self alienation so i can juxtapose that into the academics of self alienation where you have a lot of barriers and divisions that has been created where you have you have dealt on the divisions you have dealt on the conflict but you have been unable to give a solution and i think when we talk of articulating bharat it has to be articulated that india bharat through all her contradictions continued to remain a center of solutions as well as sister nivedita would say in her famous in her famous essay in fact i think that essay first appeared in the hindu from madras the national significance of the swami vivekanandas they would say the swami vivekanandas life and mission and sister nivedita says that if you told swami ji that it was the railway and the postage stamp which united us he would just like blast you and he would say that it's because there was this underlying unity that the railway and the postage could unite you because there's this theory that you know like we had a discussion once we were on big fight with mark tuli and mark tuli was of course he was he's a very nice person but he was given the responsibility of defending the raj and he says you know but the railways were made the railways um, brought so much connectivity so i said sir mark you are right but it is william please read william digby famine campaigns in south india william digby and these books are available online describes the famine situation in south india and you realize that in one province in one district you had a tremendous uh, situation of drought but you had the railways why didn't you transport food from the other district to the drought stricken district that was not done so the britishers made the railway but they always ensured that that railway was never used to give succor to the famine stricken districts but this is the second part the first part is there were no famines in this country till the british came swami vivekananda talks about this he talks about his famine relief and you see that from 1770s onward 1757 if we take the battle of palasi it is from 1770s onwards that this phenomena like drought started taking place a uh, famine famine started taking place in the country and if you reliably study there is no instance of famine the way we saw from 1770s till 1943 the great bengal famine there has been no instances of famine before that but these do not find space in how we try and understand ourselves so <laughs> there's a very there's a very interesting uh, there's a very interesting you know letter of course we know that uh, you know macaulay's minutes and all that okay uh, it's much discussed and all that it's become cliche fine but uh, one thing that we miss is you had charles traveling i mean you know because i am mentioning these because these people Uh, were were very connected to 
you know, to, to making that colonial system of education strike root in India. Now, uh, obviously, there's an argument. Some of you may ask me also. That, uh, yes, I mean, uh, did we, if we had no, if we had no English education or the Western education, scientific, et cetera, et cetera, obviously, obviously, science is universal. We need that kind of education. But that education did not come just by itself. It brought in a lot of baggage. Now, I'll come to an argument against that also, but let me finish this. That education came with a lot of baggage, and that baggage was intellectual. That baggage was of the mind. As Macaulay very beautifully said it, and we don't uh, quote that, he said that, doesn't matter. Our political, and I'm just paraphrasing, our political empire will perish someday. But we would have created an empire of the minds which would be much longer in its survival. So it's very interesting that, that uh, Charles Trevelyan in 1834 very interestingly says this. The young men brought up at our seminaries, schools, they would just name it as seminaries, turn to the prospect of improving their national institutions on the English model. OK. Instead of regarding us with dislike, they quote our society. They look upon us now. They look upon us as their natural protectors and benefactors. Now, the summit of their ambition what is the summit of their ambition? Is to resemble us. So, at one point of time, when, you, when we started being subjected, when colonial subjection started, a section of our elite, and of course, he was an exception. Shirobindo was an exception. And you know why he was an exception? Because he didn't go through the usual grind of schools. You read Shirobindo's essays on Bankim as a tribute when he passed away. And you see that Bankim, at, after a certain point of time, took his e own education in his hands. And he actually went and sat with the pundits in the tolls, learned Sanskrit from there, learned the entire technique of language there. He studied himself. At just last minute, he would prepare a bit, go and give the exam, and OK, somehow pass. But both Bankim, Sri Aurobindo, and obviously Swamiji, I mean, if you look at Swamiji's mark sheet, you wouldn't have passed, uh, got a seat at IIT. But obviously, all that he said and wrote did not come from that, uh, from those few years of schools, the school that he attended. So these are exceptions. But predominantly, the Indian elite summit of ambition was to resemble us. If I draw and fly across two centuries, I think the so-called gatekeepers of our opinion today, the so-called articulator or opinion makers today, have still not got out of that Trevelyan, I don't you want to use the word Macaulay, and then they'll say that, oh, I belong to a certain uh, Parivar, so that is why I'm using Macaulay. Uh, Macaulay, I'm saying Trevelyan. They have not got out of that Trevelyan mindset. Because their summit of ambition is still to resemble someone else. It is still to articulate other frameworks. As Sitaram Goel says it wonderfully, he says that the first thing that these sections do, and obviously you have many eminent historians and thinkers in that section, the first thing that this section does is they destroy your confidence in your traditions. Swamiji himself says that. Nothing has changed. 1890s, when Swamiji articulated it to today. And the second is, so they say that they negate all this. They destroy your confidence or your faith. Or even if you had not faith, your interest in your own, own tradition. Then they tell you, like Tagore said, that, oh, you know, 
deconstruct India, many nationalities. So, no nation. Notion of India. So, idea of India is notion of India. There was no, there was no nation. And you were surrounded by a congeries of nations. So, therefore, you can never situate yourself in the, on the global stage. Because if you, in order to be able to situate yourself on the global stage, you have to first believe that you were a nation or you were a people, that you were a civilization. Whatever may be its variations, whatever may be its contradictions. And that approach destroyed in you this feeling of, if I may very colloquially put it, India first. Because you didn't believe there was an India. You didn't believe that there was a civilizational flow. And you were taught to deconstruct India. That we were only a land of conflict. We were only a land of class conflict. And nothing more than that. Because these people didn't understand what was social reform in our context. They didn't understand what was this habit of reforming from within that has taken place over the centuries. And because you didn't have that, you could not situate yourself on the global stage. And so that's why when last year, Prime Minister Modi beautifully put it, he said, we don't want to be a balancing power. We want to be a great power. It sufficed this section to keep India a balancing power. Whoever needed her pulled her into his or her own area of influence. Whoever made use of her, whoever had an opportunity made use of her, but never gave her that recognition of that great power. But that recognition cannot come externally. We have to first feel that. But at that feeling, I know, and this is a very simple sentence, we have to feel that. But that feeling has to come from our systems and our systems of education, our syllabuses. Suddenly, one group decides that, uh, well, you know, R.C. Majumdar, Jadunath Sarkar, K. Nilakanta Shastri, who reads Nilakanta Shastri? Especially his book on the Chola Empire. Why do, we, why do the Chinese today speak of themselves as a civilizational state? They say that we have a long history, we have a long tradition, we have so much variety, we have the possibility of becoming, or we are becoming an economic powerhouse. And our admiral, it may be fictitious, I would like to believe it is, our admiral Zhong He, you know, sailed his ships right into the Indian Ocean. So therefore, we are reclaiming our civilizational space. Why can't we do that? We are an ancient civilization. We have a huge amount of diversity. We are a civilizational state in that we are managing our diversity into an overwhelming umbrella-like unity, and yet we are unable to articulate that. I mean, again, as I'm saying, that things are changing. But all these years, we have not been able to do that. We have always either been here or there. We have not been upfront in speaking about these, about our past experience and future potentials. So when the, for example, when the Chinese want to come into the Indian Ocean, we say that the Chola fleet went up right up to the East China Sea. But there's nothing to be apologetic about it. There's nothing to be step backing about it. Because these are backed by evidences of history. As much as they are using evidence, we use evidence. It is the, you, you see, it is, there is a basic difference. China had a Joseph Nidam. Our Joseph Nidam didn't, never appeared. Whatever he may have written. It is because we were systematically prevented from a Joseph Nidam from developing amidst our systems. Uh, you had someone like Dharampal. I don't know how many of you have read him. I'm sure you have. Some of you have. He functioned right out of Chennai here. He did most of his seminal work here. The Chingalpet inscriptions. Please read his, read his uh, work on the Chingalpet inscriptions. One of the most food-sufficient district in the country. 
our concept of food security. What is it that we meant by food security civilizationally? There was always enough and plenty. There was the concept of scarcity, of need, need as in negatively, was hardly present in our civilizational consciousness. And these are recorded, but they're never taught. Because it serves some, it serves some within and without to keep thinking of ourselves as forever an aspiring power or a middle power, but never a great power. So I think, I think I've spoken enough. Is it more than half an hour? Uh, so I, I think I should give a break now. So I think uh, essentially what I have termed it, and not only me, there are some others also. They have termed it the recovery of India. So I think we should, each of us, in our own spheres, think about this overweening vision of the recovery of India. If you were read, to read Dharampal, and he's got five volumes, and I would urge you to read him, it fantastically changes your perception about your society, your societal systems, and your way of looking at yourself. Dharampal made this empirical study from documents across Europe, documents on India, recorded by British East India Company officers. And it's very interesting. You know, if you read the description of uh, Scottish officers, if you read the description of French explorers, and if you read the description of British explorers, there's a great difference on how they describe and look at India. So while James Mill, we know about James Mill, History of British India, eight volumes or 10 volumes. James Mill never visited India, but wrote History of British India. And his book was mandatory study for all civil servants throughout the ages. We don't know about, for example, another, you know, a colonel in the East India Company who has m massive records on how he saw India. Your own governor, Thomas Munro of Madras presidency, all that he has told about India. What has happened is, we have been told only about one idea of India. We have never accepted that there are ideas of India, that there can be many readings of India. Because it has been either you fall in line with the idea of India, and if you don't subscribe to that idea of India, then either you are intolerant or you are a fascist or whatever, whatever. You know. so, uh, so what has happened is, there has been a shrinking of the dialogic space, there has been a shrinking of the intellectual space. And that sh shrinking is not because of us. That shrinking has happened because of a certain mindset which said that, look, which delineated the study of India. I mean, if you look at Jadunath Sarkar, in that period and that age, like uh, today there's a lot of prancing and dancing going about because of a book on that has been written on Aurangzeb, a reinterpretation of Aurangzeb. But if one were to read Jadunath Sarkar, one would have a completely different interpretation of Aurangzeb than the book that has appeared and is trying to whitewash many things that Aurangzeb did. But uh, Jadunath Sarkar was a historian. He read the original sources in Persian. He knew French. But one fine day, we were told, oh, he's outdated, you know. Let's not read him. His techniques are outdated. So you started shrinking the possibilities of many narratives. You threw out Ramesh Chandra Majumdar, outdated nationalist, Hindu nationalist, throw him out. Nilakanta Shastri, uh, glorifying the Cholas, throw him out. And then you had only 
the Habibs and the Thapars of the world. And they decided who could write history, who could interpret history, who could speak on history. But during Jadunath's time, it was not like that. You never had professional historians. Anyone who had a knack and interest in history could write history, could establish himself, and could gain a certain foothold and gain a certain amount of recognition. That was the Catholicity of intellectualism, of intellectual space that was existent in India till about 70s. So therefore, you have this entire debate in the 60s. So my submission is this. We have to first articulate Bharat to ourselves and then articulate it on the global stage. Definitely, things are changing. If you see the efforts of various groups, various scholars, various initiatives that have been taken place, it is changing. The articulation on the global stage is also changing. There is a perception that there is a great churn happening in India. That while there is an aspiration to change at the governance, at the brass tax level, there is also an aspiration to have space at the ideational level. And I think as soon as these two aspirations merge, or at least meet, that is when we will be able to articulate the many dimensions of Bharat. We should not get stuck with one dimension. We should be upfront. And all our thinkers that we look up to, starting from Bankim to Sri Aurobindo to Swami Vivekananda, Dindayal Upadhyay, Shama Prashad Mukherjee, the line of thinkers that we have looked at have always talked about self-renewal. And in the process of self-renewal, you internalize all that is your core, and you either reform or you reject that which has not been able to keep up with the pace of time, and which you feel is no more an integral or necessary part of, our, of your civilizational march. We were never a stagnant or rigid. We never had a stagnant or rigid mind space, largely, broadly. I'm not getting into specifics. I'm talking about those whose ideas mattered, those who shaped a number of narratives. So I think in that space, Bankim is one of the foremost articulators of that idea of Bharat. And it is the perenniality of thinkers like Bankim and Sri Aurobindo, Swami Vivekananda, that basically enables us or empowers us to keep generating or trying to generate narratives. And I think uh, the time has come. If we say that the 21st century is the Asian century, uh, we must also say that the 21st century is India's century. And if it is India's century, then we need to articulate that Bharat. If one Samuel Huntington could create such a debate for years, and by asking the essential question, who are we, among the other things that he said, I think it's time to seriously ask ourselves, and if we know, to articulate that forcefully. The rest is, as they say, post-truth. So thank you so much. Uh, it's a great honor and opportunity uh, to be able to say a few words. I don't know if there has been coherence, but uh, I just said a few things. I tried to sound as academic as possible. Um, I just hope I have not disappointed you, especially those who have come from so far. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for the very informative session. Now the floor is open for questions. Uh, hello. Hello, sir. Sir, our uh, school syllabus is, uh, forms a very important part of uh, our own articulation of ourselves. So, like many uh, 
thinkers and writers like Sanjeev Sanyal and uh, Rajiv Malhotra, even Shashi Tharoor, they have pointed out that uh, our, uh, I mean, there is a lot of improvement that is needed in our school syllabus. So can you throw some light on uh, the efforts uh, that are going on on that side? And can you uh, tell us a timeline of when we'll see that change in our uh, school syllabus, especially social science? You see, I have basically stopped. Is this on? Uh, yeah. I have basically stopped answering that question from uh, this way. Uh, this question I have uh, been asked a number of times. I cannot give you a specific answer that uh, whether change is taking place because, again, education is state subject. Somebody will have a problem, etc. Et but you mentioned a few writers. My uh, solution to start with is a little different because, okay, obviously change will take place. It's taking place also. There's a revision of certain textbook, NCRT textbook, which is taking place. Now, if I say this, again, some people, oh, they're rewriting history and all that. The fact that we have not been taught what is Uttara Meru inscription means that we have actually not been taught right history. Why children sitting in Chennai, in Madras, in Tamil Nadu to start with, even I should know, studying in West Bengal, should not know about the first constitution that we gave ourselves in that sense, and which was a uniquely Indian product. Anyway. The best way is bombard the young minds with such books, with such work. Let, let more such books come out in the market. Let there be great you know, push publicity, discussion about those books. Those amongst us, the younger ones, who are to catch it will immediately catch. Because you see, as K. Munshi would say, you have to always have a minority. It's a minority that transmits that transmits ideas, essentially. And it is through that transmission of ideas by minorities that the civilizational cycle or flow is maintained. And that you can generate new ideas also. So you see, one thing is the official system. Ah, the system will do OK in its own pace. There'll be politics over it. There'll be this, that. I leave that aside. Number of people, young people are writing, are speaking. One should just flood. Let more such young people write, speak, get together. And these efforts will attract the right kind of minds. And it is then that you gradually form a critical mass. It's not a work of five years or six years. It's a work of next 20, 25 years. But it will happen this way. Because you can't, you can't stop Rajiv Malhotra from writing a book. He's writing it. It is generating a discussion. This has to be done in a greater scale. Sir, my question is uh, specific to the West Bengal. We have seen that uh, pre-independence, uh, we have a lot of leaders, philosophers from there, like Bamkin Chan Chattopadhyay, Vivekananda. Also in the Bhakti movement, we saw uh, Ch Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and uh, Subhash Chandra Bose. So now, the, uh, now the recently we saw some incident is happening there by uh, Jadhapur University students. So what do you think, what goes wrong with that state? that uh, pupil, the spirit of nationalism, which was uh, once there was a proverb that when Bengal thinks that it creates a revolution in the country. So what do you think, where that spirit has gone? The problem is Bengal has been only after revolutions, what to do? Sometime world revolution. No, actually, you see, Bengal has had a very robust tradition of intellectual tradition, as you rightly said, intellectual, spiritual tradition, social reform, etc. You see, partition took its toll. Partition destabilized the entire state. And my reading is, had Shama Prashad Mukherjee survived, Bengal politics would have been different. With his sudden demise, the entire Gradual, gradually, I'm, I, I can discuss, I can, can I discuss history, political yeah. history yeah. also, no problem. So, uh, I should not get, I hope you don't get letters again. Asking. So, um, you see what happens, what happened was that um, 
the entire politics of Bengal, you know, got gradually controlled by the left movement, especially the refugee, the refugee, entire refugee movement was controlled by the left. It's just a kind of, you know, it just happened in the sense that because there was space, there was no strong political presence in that way, which could work for the refugees. B.C. Roy passed away by 62. B.C. Roy passed away in 62, and by 67, you had the first United Front government. Now, let me be very frank. It is an accepted fact that once you adopt a certain ideology, which says that you are part of a larger international movement and that you are beyond borders and beyond nations, obviously, you will not be in a position to produce solid intellectual thought or output which is grounded to your cultural root. So Bengal between 1977 and 2011 faced this predicament where systematically all your cultural institutions, your education institutions, your sense of the past was diluted and decimated. And you became deracinated. So as I said, you talked about the revolution in Vietnam, but you didn't know what is happening in your backyard. You were not bothered about it. And then after 2011, it is for everyone to see what is happening. So it is very unfortunate that Bengal has got into this cycle from which she is unable to extricate herself. But something very unique about Bengal is its grassroots societies, its grass, grassroots socio-religious movements, which we tend to overlook. And I can tell you that it is in these socio-religious movements that the essential Bengal is still held. That is where Bankim becomes even more relevant today in Bengal. Because he appeals to that latent attachment to one's cultural roots. I think once that clicks, Bengal will start responding. Uh, but before that, there is an entire mountain of lumpen proletariat sitting, you know, so one has to manage that. Uh, so I, I have, uh, sure. Sir, I have a uh, very informative and I, really, I also didn't know about this. So I have one question and one observation. One question is uh, that um, this whole project of articulating Bharat, whether we call it an alternative idea of India or another idea of, idea of India or the idea of Bharat, how do we actually fix the trajectories of this particular project? Because the good thing is that, despite the when we talk about the idea of India, Shilani and, and the ilk, and we, we know what it means, and they have appropriated completely Tagore and uh, so on. So um, uh, so this idea of India, which is modern, which is progressive, which is forward-looking, future-looking, at least that is how it is represented, and the idea of Bharat, which may be represented by that, those Correct. as regressive, yeah. as fundamental, yeah. and, and so on, blah, blah, blah. So but as, as somebody who is a little balanced and all that, so how do we reconcile these two competing principles, at least in perception? The good part is that idea of Bharat, the good part of idea of Bharat is that we completely escape the baggage of the idea of India. Okay? But the bad part is that it also we also lose a little bit of so-called modern legitimacy, constitutionalism, this and that. So that is my question. First question is I genuinely want to learn how to make this work vis-a-vis -vis the idea of India. That is a question I would like to learn from you. And second is just a query, maybe you can just respond that actually I believe that this is the time of great awakening. Absolutely. And, and we have to convert this political goodwill into academic output. Otherwise, if the time passes, if we don't really do anything in the next five, 10 years, as you know, they have already announced post-truth. Post-truth is basically a nice way to delegitimate popular understanding of society and life. Correct. So this is my observation. Absolutely. The second, the, the, 
with your observation, I don't think there can be a second opinion. And I think we all need to put our minds together, come up with innovative projects, efforts. And again, I want to say one thing, you know. I believe, perhaps that is because of my training, we need to do a lot of things on our own. Not, yes, official institutional support is always welcome. It is always required. But many great things were done beyond official and institutional support. We need to really think of these things. For example, this entire project that they have taken up, Professor ICHRA, Ekhane Chennai Tejini member, CPSA Bajaji Shade, Dr. JK Bajaj, and MD Shinivas. So the entire effort that they have taken up of the Encyclopedia of Indian Science on their now. Since they are members of the ICHR, so there is some kind of support. There is some kind of uh, <laughs> entry that they are making in other places also. Some are laughing at them. Some are not uh, trying to oppose them. But what I am saying is, is, nevertheless, it is an effort that they are doing. So there is absolutely no second opinion on what you are saying. That we have to convert that into a you know, great, uh, a, a real solid kind of a movement forward. Some of it is being done. But tremendous amount remains to be done because, as I said, for long years, all of us <coughs> have been the victims of academic apartheid. And we were kept out on the margins. Therefore, there has been a tremendous amount of resistance and incapacity on our side, on our part, to really hone our skills, to take advantage of opportunities to make use of possibilities, because we were victims of this academic apartheid. That is why Professor Irfan Habib will say, don't speak, you are not a historian. So if Professor Bibi Lal says, through empirical evidence, that look, I have undertaken an excavation. I am not an RSS VHP man. But it clearly is that there was a, there is an evidence of a temple here. My finding is just that. I am not giving a value judgment on whether there should be a temple or a mosque here. But I am saying that as per my archaeology, there is a temple here. So Professor Bibi Lal, former DGI, ASI, is called by Irfan Habib a pamphleteer of the RSS. But if you tell Irfan Habib, sir, you are a card-holding member of the Communist Party of India, that is legitimate. So you can be that and write history and pass off as a historian. But, an, uh, but actually a historian, who has based himself on academic uh, rigor, finds something else which differs from you, you label him as a pamphleteer of a certain group to which he has never belonged. So this is the kind of atmosphere that we have operated in. And in that atmosphere, to convert that is going to take time, but it can be done. For your first point, you have to invite me for another talk. <laughs> then one can I can speak on that. But uh, you see, my point is, we are not. Let us not compete with them. Let us first define what is our idea and articulate our, our idea of Bharat. And even this concept of modernity. That's why I said, please read Dharampal. It will stand your concept of modernity on its head. At least it that did that to me. And mind you, I read Sri Aurobindo. I grew up reading Sri Aurobindo, the defense of Indian culture, Renaissance in India. Fine. Then when I read Dharampal, what happens is, no, you do one seminal reading, you do supplementary reading. So Sri Aurobindo, when you read Sri Aurobindo, it is seminal. And then you start reading Dharampal, you read others, it becomes supplementary. It builds upon your understanding of the actual text that you have read of Sri Aurobindo. When I read Dharampal, my concept of modernity stood on its head. What we say is, expression? Those people who are in the hands of us are also connected to our roots. You see, this concept of dehati, this, this expression of dehati has become pejorative. Why? It is a very colonial, it's a very, it's a, that idea of India mindset. So, like we say, the Khan market consensus or the Luton's uh, consensus. I have now termed it the gold market, the gold market clique. So, it's like that. So basically, we need to be upfront about our articulation of what we believe is Bharat. And in that also, whatever garbage is there also has to be thrown out. 
you have to accept that, sir, this is garbage. It has to be thrown out. Please throw it out. Anyone else is peddling it, let them peddle. But we should be very clear what is garbage and what is not. And then be upfront about it. But even that, in that also, there is going to be resistance. Because essentially, this articulation of Bharat questions the idea of India. That idea of India, which you allowed only a few people to come in. Oh, uh, that idea of India, which get, le gave legitimacy to only one tr you know, strand of thinking. Moment you did not belong to that, to that IIC India International Club of idea of India, you were regressive. You were illegitimate. You had no locus standi. Therefore, you snigger when a uh, why Sudarshan Rao becomes chairman of ICHR because Oxford University Journal Press Journal did not publish his paper, and that was not peer reviewed by Romila Thakur. But Irfan, uh, but uh, Sudarshan Rao came from Varangal University. Why does your subalternism doesn't stick to him? Your subalternism should have accepted him as chairman ICHR. Doesn't matter he didn't write any paper. Accept that a subaltern has come up to your seat and sat. Uh, no, because he didn't go to Cambridge. Does anyone, re does, does anyone remember w what was Nurul Hassan's PhD? Nobody remembers. But he was your demigod because he patronized you. Because he, he could speak English and he went to Oxford after all. <laughs> you know, so, so it's like that. No, okay. but, I mean, so, you know, it was that entire, that group. So that's why um, uh, all, all those who worshipped Harold Lasky became your, your co-partners or your co travelers, even if they differed in politics from you. Because, you know, if you have, if you have studied under Harold Lasky, it means you are someone. Poor Sudarshan Rao came from Varangal Kakatiya University. And so you can keep demonizing him. So, you know, this, and then immediately we become defensive. Ha, sir, oh, to paper nahi hai, sahi hai. Ek bhi paper nahi likha hai. Kitab bhi nahi likha hai. Nahi likha hai, sir. He has a historical sense. Historian hai. Padai hai. Do you need one uh, you need one Will Durant to come and head ICHR? It's an autonomous body under the Ministry of HRT doling out some funds for some historical research. You have controlled it for 40 years. From 71, you started the Freedom Project for 40 years. After that, you didn't finish it for 40 years. Freedom movement को अगर आप चंपारण से 47 लेते हैं वो भी 40 साल हो गया आपका 40 साल तक भी चलता रहा you could not ride towards freedom history of the freedom movement but that is acceptable that is possible if it is you because you know as they say all of us are equal but some of us are more equal the pig said so ये ये मने It's audible. Okay. Uh, well, I hope my question won't be again interpreted as something political. Uh, but I wanted to build on his question. We are on all political animals. <laughs> we can't expect ex ex escape politics in India. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I want to build on the first question on primary education. Uh, my question is on the Right to Education Act. Uh, we know that it is kind of uh, skewed against a particular community yeah. because minority institutions do not have to come under uh, RTE. And while it uh, imposes... Uh, connected to the repeal RTE group somehow? Uh, I'm not connected to any group, but you know I have read a lot about it. Ah, and I think it's important right. to do that. Even if not repeal it, standardize it. Everybody should come yes. under it. Absolutely. I agree. Uh, you know, 30 percent cannot be a minority and get away with not adhering to our RT. You see, my personally, if you ask me, many of us agree with this, understand what I have repeatedly told many of my friends who have raised this issue. And we had done it to a certain extent also. That I think this repeal RT must come up as a people's movement. People Conscious so, citizens must so start working is not towards many demanding. People are aware of it at all. Exactly, exactly. So that is why you see there has to be two dimensions of this. In every society, people's activism is a legitimate activism, especially when it comes to these issues, which concern our long-term, you know, narrative of education. So what I've said is that first is you have to educate people about RT. None of us 
Most of us are not aware of it, of its intricacies. Second is there has to be a conscious movement of the intelligentsia intellectuals who start calling, demanding for the repeal of the RT with cogent points, arguments, and approaching those who are uh, the powers that be. And you know that many of them also think the way we do, but we are all functioning within a certain setup, and there is a certain method of doing things. <coughs> but you see, this repeal RT, the demand also has not raised has not been raised as strongly as it should. Therefore, it has to start as that. Uh, I, well, but when you are in a majority like you know the Modi government is now, should there really be a repeal RT? You know uh, what movement to correct something that is really skewed? No, but why not? Uh, first of all, the majority we still have, have to get majority in Rajya Sabha. Every time we are reminded that we, we don't have majority. We'll get there, yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, the other is no, but why not? Because these are all legitimate expressions. And I'm not saying a kind of a movement which is like what? I mean, it should be something which is very ideative and which is very argumentative and logical and say that, look, this is what we feel. It has to gather support and representation from across the spectrum. It has to have a number of people on board and who are part of that. But you know, there have to be some people who have to very consciously start working on it. Because I get many of my, I know they are very well-meaning, and we, I have a lot of patience with them, and they are very hardworking, and they are very sincere. But just by tagging me on tweet and saying that, oh, you are just becoming like them, it's not going to serve any purpose. One has to build up a cogent point and not again sit back and complain. I'm sure that is possible. You mentioned about uh, Uttara inscription, which, which is around 1,000 years old. But it seems to, uh, seems like uh, Kiradi is also 2000, 2,500 years old. But the present government seems to be not interested in doing uh, excavation in that. Even after primary, primary inscriptions, they, they almost stopped that excavation. And uh, they transferred that uh, archaeologist to Assam, Assam and all. Uh, what's your opinion on that? that this kind of I, have no, I have not actually studied this. It depends whether it is under the state government or under the central government. Central government. So I don't know why. I mean, I don't think uh, there is any reason for stopping or something like that. I, I'm sure there is nothing like that. And if it is 2,000 years old, it should come out. People should write about it. They should send representation, meet the local member of parliament and say, boss, this is what is happening. Please look into the Ministry of Culture. You feel that this is your government, that this is a government which you have voted to power. And it is a government which is unprecedentedly responsive on a much larger scale than previous dispensations were. And therefore, we should, I think, very confidently take advantage of that. attracted towards novels written in English. They are reading Percy Jackson and all those stuff. And even Amish Patel, people like, they are trying to copy the Western Correct. pattern. So what can we do to bring these people? And I'm sorry to say, so many writers that you mentioned, I was not knowing. So how can I tell my kids about them? So, and they feel very, why, Mama, you are talking about philosophy when I try to tell them that read about Vivekananda. What should we do to make them feel interested in this? Secondly, why we are following a still British pattern in schools like KV, where we go for scouts and guides? There are so many things that I went into the when I went into the detail. The dress code and everything is not suitable to Indian conditions, and still we are following them and obeying how to do yoga told by a Britisher in scouts and guides. So why? So that is what, no, you see, in Bengal, we had this Bratachari movement started by Guru Shadai Dath, who had started that, uh, it was an Indian, actually an Indian indigenous, uh, you know, movement of uh, folk songs on dance and self-defense and etc. And that petered out in, so, uh, uh, now, I absolutely agree with you. Why should we, uh, type and ke, sagar ke, pe ye karo, karo, but, uh, well, yes, absolutely, 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 I agree. 
and many such movements are there in our country which had taken a start and then gradually disappeared these are the things that we need to actually rediscover reinitiate think about it actually you see it requires it's not question of you or me it is a change of mindset and that change of mindset doesn't happen you know from election to election a change of mindset requires an age and it requires a generational change and in that each of us individually also play an important role policy and all that policy change also requires a mindset but policy change is also inspired and guided and it's both ways by societal change or by the consciousness in society you can get a mandate in 30 years because there is a consciousness in society that it wants change and so therefore you get a such a resounding mandate in 30 years so one can discount that but again we are also very unique that we have a number of such efforts that have been constantly made or uh, when you talk about policy change you know that it has to come about inspired by a certain mindset unless that happens that's why modi ji talks when he talks about sanitation he says that it's a mindset change is giving a lot of emphasis on that maybe because kya ho raha hai kuch nahi ho raha hai in no use externally complaining are we actually changing our mindset even if we are changing suppose i want them to read the word so are they available enough to uh, be attractive for them exactly you see that is why i was saying that we need to make such text available it's not that they are not there I think you see, uh, we had S K Chakravarti in I M Calcutta. He would say something very interesting. He would say that the primary unit in the in India still remains the family, despite uh, whatever nuclearization, etc., etc., taking place. So again, I, I, I if I talk as a pure educationist, it comes down to that family unit. But that can't be done by a certain amount of push. it has to be done through a process of osmosis and uh, some of the best teachers have been parents actually and we, because our family system is still intact we can still bring about that kind of push through that it may look like that uh, you know it may look like that squirrel with the sand on the shoulder trying to do the ram setu you will think uh, just me as a mother how much will i do just this much what change that makes but as i said that the critical mass you know there are others like you also who should think i am sure they are thinking but again uh, perhaps again it is our trait that we should not only rely on that policy because after all policies are made by bureaucrats to be very frank there is a, a large direction and you don't have always have leaders who will tell you or who will say that this is the kind of policy and implementation that i want which is happening today but obviously it is the right time now to do many of these things no doubt about it uh, okay so just uh, uh, one more question no, just a short comment on it uh, not this is the last question uh, yeah. that was okay just a short comment on this okay sure um, uh, i mean i as i mean i am an engineering student here but uh, reading history today and reading some of rajiv malhotra's works and other works which are related i feel in a sense cheated that i have not you know given the kind of exposure to the history that our our country has had and uh, i also feel uh, sometimes that we should have institutions like iit for humanities uh, as such to take a discourse on the other side uh, that is that is something which i felt and exactly and also um, uh, i mean apart from that uh, uh, it, it's not only the language that you mention i mean even if you probably wear indian clothes and go out in fact i met uh, one person who is in uh, in institute of math science who wears a dhoti and he is a mathematician like he is doing his phd in math and he told me that you know if i go like this people won't think i am a mathematician because i don't wear the clothes so i think that mindset is probably something which should really change thank you
my my whole intention today was to make you feel cheated. So I'm happy that you have been cheated. Thank you so much. And uh, I have of course traveled with the Indian dress across the world. I've been to Heidelberg, I've been to uh, I walked the Red Square in Indian dress and got to see Lenin's museum in home. So it feels good. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to call, uh, invite Professor Verma, our faculty advisor of the Vande Matram group, to appreciate our guest uh, on the behalf of IIT Madras with a memento. Now I would like to thank our guest for taking time out of his busy schedule for coming here and addressing the audience on articulating Bharat. I would also like to thank our faculty advisors as well as the audience for joining us here. We have come towards the end of the program, but uh, we will end it with uh, singing the national anthem. <laughs> Thank you once again. I would request uh, our uh, Rama Shankar sir, faculty advisor of the Vande Matram group, and all the faculty members and the group members of the Vande Matram group to be on the stage for a group photograph.